meeting the order of general services. Motion for the meeting minutes. We have a motion to accept uh, last month's meeting minutes. I move. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Carried. All right, so the first docket is adopting local law intro number 1-2021, authorizing 12 and 13 year old licensed hunters to hunt deer with a firearm or crossbow during hunting season with the supervision of a licensed adult pursuant to environmental conservation law 110935. Questions or discussions? Is there a public comment period? Yes, the public hearing is set for June 1st. Okay. So after the public comment period, you'll be able to vote on June 1st if you want. Any other questions or discussion? This is just to send this to the June 1st meeting, as I understand. Okay. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <coughs> Resolution awarding bid and authorizing agreement with Empire Northeast to replace and install a new boiler system at the Lewis County Public Safety Building in accordance with the specifications and requirements set forth in the RFP at a cost of $169,770, commencing on or about June 2nd, 2021 through July 2nd, 2021. Any questions or discussions? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Carried. Resolution accepting, accepting grant award in the amount of $59,371 and authorizing a memorandum of understanding between the County of Lewis and the Village of Wobble to share grant funding for years 2020-2021 criminal justice discovery reform. Any questions? Yeah, the, the Village did a plan and we did a plan, is that my understanding? That's how this money came No, the, the, uh, the DA actually submitted a plan and was allowed to ask for other law enforcement um, entities if they wanted to participate under that grant that was submitted. So the village of Loudville uh, said, said yeah. they would. And so we have to have just a short MOU with them to authorize the funding. Thanks, John. Any other questions? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Resolution to transfer funds in the county roads accounts in the amount of 210000 for expenses related to the annual CHIPS program. Any questions? Is this all the money we've got for the year? Or is no, we're up to $3.5 million in CHIPS this year, which is far more than usual because they made up for the amount that they cut last year, plus they gave us more for one. So um, we're doing quite well on the chips. It'll take us a few years probably to spend it all. Well, this is strictly for the county. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with the town. They get their own. They they get and administer their own chips. But they also got a fifty percent increase. Yeah, they still got a lot too. Oh, okay, we're gonna be able to spend ours. It's going to take us a few years. That's what I thought would be my guess. Does that money carry over? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, transfer. Um, that's money we're putting in there so they can do the checks because it didn't have paid before. Because this is additional funds we didn't have in the budget. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? We still make pay payments on the vehicles, trucks. Not the chips. We don't, we, that's a separate capital program that we put in our own funds for. So we used chips money last year. We did, but we didn't enter leases. We, we just paid that stuff off cash. So we have our annual $200,000, roughly $200,000 capital program. And then last year, we couldn't build any roads because nobody could work. So instead of, we thought it might be use it or lose it. So we bought equipment instead. Any other questions or discussions? All in favor, aye. 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 
nay. Opposed? Motion carried. Resolution authorizing supplemental agreement number two to the contract between the New York State DOT and Lewis County in order to receive an additional one hundred thousand for the final design phase of the transportation federal age aid bridge replacement project known as County Route Twenty Nine over West Stone Creek. Any questions? All in favor, aye. All those names. Gary. Resolution in support of proposed bills S2708 and A1203, amending <coughs> laws to create an ATV trail fund, use of ATVs and increased weight limit on the definition of an ATV under the VTL to include UTVs and or side-by-sides up to a dry weight of 1,800 pounds. Any questions or discussions? Jackie, you want to comment on what we heard last night? Sounds like the bill is stalled. Um, I think Larry has also heard that from Grupo's office as well. Typically, it never makes it out of transportation committee, but um, I did like this bill because it addressed a lot of the issues, not just the weight. Any other questions? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Resolution authorizing acceptance and appropriation of 2021 New York State Department of Health Walkability Action Institute grant funding in the amount of 15000 for the Departments of Planning and Community Development and Public Health to participate in virtual courses to develop team action plans and implement PSE outcomes to make our community more walkable. Any questions or discussions? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Carried. Resolution authorizing the Lewis County Planning and Community Development Department to submit an application for New York State Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, dash CV funding administered by the Housing Trust Fund <coughs> Corporation's Office of Community Renewal in an amount not to exceed $1 million for broadband infrastructure needs. Any questions? Is that, is that million dollars right? I thought there was some discussion a month or two ago about 1.5 was a better number. So this is uh, exclusively money that we're applying from the federal government, so this would not be part of local share. Oh, there's only two zip codes in Lewis County that qualify as low to moderate income where we can apply for CDBG funds. One is the village of Port Lyle, is the west side of the village, the ex village of Harrisville, all the way to the east uh, shore of Lake Bone Park. So there's two zip codes that, if you were able to get funds from the federal government, we could do a lot with broadband without having to put in much local funds. So that's what we're going for. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or discussions? Mm -hmm. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Resolution to authorize and approve an agreement with Jewel Assets, Inc. for a community choice aggregation administrator for Lewis County municipalities in accordance with the specifications and requirements set forth in the RFP with no upfront cost or fees to the county as a participant. I really don't know what that is. What is that specifically? So last month we put out an RFP request for proposals for um, a consultant to assist us with uh, the process of going through the state's uh, energy aggregation program which would allow us to purchase energy collectively as communities. So if New Bremen and Lauville and Denmark's boards all voted to join this collectively, we could purchase energy together and they could offer their household a discount. So um, it's something that's being done all across the state. It makes sense in Lewis County because we have a lot of renewable energy resources. We could, in the future, if we get a robust 
purchasing you know group together we could tell developers that want to build solar wind or hydro here that they have to sell a certain proportion certain portion of their energy to us in at a discounted rate so it's kind of a step towards bulk purchasing of, of energy which would potentially down the line give us the ability to, to siphon off some of the resources that are being produced right here in this county so it's a big picture thing but it starts with getting experts on board that can you know that do this stuff on a regular basis because our planning department is pretty familiar but this is pretty technical stuff so we need experts to help us okay thanks Any other, any other questions? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Carried. Resolution to approve an agreement between the county and Dank to provide technical engineering, administration, and project management services to assist the county's ad hoc broadband expansion project committee at a cost not to exceed $100,000 with funding for these services from the American Rescue Plan resources to Lewis County. Any questions or discussion? <coughs> All in favor, aye. 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 All those nay. Resolution approving agreement between the Lewis County Sheriff's Department and the Harrisville Central School District to provide a deputy sheriff to serve as the school resource officer for the period commencing on or about September 7th, 2021 through June 30th, 2022, at a minimum estimated cost of $62,000, with adjustments to be made during the term to account for actual costs and any contractual increase obligations, representing 55% of the full year cost of the deputy sheriff thereto assigned. Any questions? Um, I'd like to go ahead and do a motion that uh, we table this for a month to give us a chance to look into it and better understanding the cost. So I'll make that a motion for number 11. I'll second. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Jerry, are we going to, in the meantime, then, appoint a committee or something to? Who's a looking in there? It's right here. The, the committee. Yeah. 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 Anybody yes. else that wants to, we'll give them the same information we're looking at. Okay. And help us make good decisions. Okay, the next one is resolution approving agreement between the Lewis County Sheriff's Department and the South Lewis Central School District to provide a deputy sheriff to serve as the school resource officer for a period commencing on or about September 7th, 2021 through June 30th, 2022, at a minimum estimated cost of $61,000 with adjustments to be made during the term to account for actual costs and any contractual increase ob obligations representing 55% of the full year cost of the deputy sheriff there to assign. Any questions? I'd like to make a motion that uh, we table this one for a month also. I'll second. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <coughs> Carry. The next one is resolution approving agreement between the Lewis County Sheriff's Department and the Copenhagen Central School District to provide a deputy sheriff to serve as the as the school resource officer for the period commencing on or about September 7th, 2021 through June 30th, 2022 at a minimum estimated cost of $61,000 with adjustment to be made during the term to account for actual costs and any contractual increase obligations representing 55% of the full year cost of the deputy sheriff there to assign. I'd like to make a motion that we go ahead and table this for a month for further discussion and gathering of information. All in favor, aye. Oh, I need someone to second that. I mean, excuse me, I, we have a second. I'll second. All in favor, aye. Aye. 
proposed name here. Jerry, I, I did have a good conversation this afternoon right before we got here with Scott Connell, the superintendent mm -hmm. over at Copenhagen. I think he would be a really great resource to just fill us in a little bit from the education side. Uh, why, you know, they he, this is something he supports, it's something their schools wanted. I think there's a lot of good reasons why, you know, the school resource officers can be a positive, even in our schools where we don't really have a violent crime problem, but at least the way he put it is just being a, uh, a good mode of community policing, especially with young people. It's, I would consider him a great resource and maybe the other administrators from the other schools just as we work on it over the next month. But I agree we do need to collect some more information. Yeah, and I would like to bring all three of them. Yeah. If we can set up a meeting where all of them can make it at one time, it's even better. But if I got to be staggered, I think the committee would be willing to do two or three different dates. Or even if they just want to submit written statements or something yeah, like that, yeah. I think that'd be fine. And so we can have a discussion and get a little bit better understanding of stuff. Uh, can we get you to reach out? <laughs> yep, we'll do it. Okay, appreciate it. I, I would think that we should invite the other two because this started out, as I remember it, South Lewis, Sheriff was the first one. And then Harrisville came online. Now Copenhagen's come online. Might as well invite Law Academy and Beaver River. There's no sense in Beaver River. That would verify what's going on because I didn't know that yet. They've got their own resource officer. Yeah. All the more reason to invite them, see how they're handling it. Are they handling it through you, sure? No. Okay. I, I would invite all five all five places myself to find out how it's going. Okay. Do you want them to come to the committee next month or do you want to do a separate meeting? Well, I would like it done before yeah. then, in the next week or two of the yeah. committee thing. That way, I think so. We have a chance chance to digest it. We have a chance to ask more questions if we haven't, and we do it on committee day. Oof, second. Yep. Sounds good to me. Everybody. So you're going to wait until next committee or no? No. Yeah. Okay. I'd like in the next week or two. Gotcha. Just like that. Yep, we'll set it up. Thank you. Okay, the next one is resolution amending compensation plan of the County of Lewis with reference to the Sheriff's Department to create one full-time deputy sheriff, grade 23. <laughs> uh, is that the backfill from our SO if we do it? Okay, I'll make a motion to table that one for a moment. I'll second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Carried. Resolution to appropriate funds in the sheriff's accounts in the amount of $37,740 to reflect an insurance recovery for a vehicle determined to be unrepairable with proceeds to offset future lease costs for a replacement vehicle acquired under the Enterprise Lease Program. Questions or discussions? Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, that was a deer car? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Resolution authorizing amendment change order number one to agreement between the County of Lewis and CNS Technical Resources for price increases in certain materials at an additional cost of $22,785 for the Lovell Solid Waste Transfer Station Upgrade Project. Okay, uh, essentially with the escalating cost everything else, while well, we negotiated the contract, it was a little bit longer stretch, and the person who was warden bid saying the cost rose by that much. Um, Marloth and Judith is supposed to look at their bid prices and go over them and see if they were within the ballpark or were over the increase already. And um, you reach out to them? Yep, they are waiting to hear from CNS uh, what Barton and Judas would like, which we would in turn like to see, is they're basically behind, peel back their original bid and show us the estimates from their subcontractors that justify these increases. So CNS is saying that their subcontractor, for example, for steel, is saying, oh, our price from when you fill out your bid paperwork to now has gone up $3,095. Uh, 
Okay, that's legitimate. That's a $2 million project, $22,000, we can handle it. But they got to at least show proof that the original quote was, you know, here, the new quote is here. So. And, you know, what we'll do is, um, do we want to put a caveat in there? Yeah, we, we, I wouldn't, I mean, I would say let's move it forward in June, but in June, if we don't have this documentation by June 1st, I wouldn't approve it because they could just, you know, we can't take the word for it. They've been, we have a contract, so they have to show us. Yeah, you want us to put that uh, we're not paying until we see them? Yeah, or yeah, either, you can either add it as a motion or just know that in June, if we don't have it, you're not, we're going to table. Do you guys want to put a motion on that? So it's just not point two thousand dollars going out. They got to show documentation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What does the contract say about the price adjusting mm -hmm. increases and stuff? I mean, most contracts have something in there about once you bid and you accept it. Yeah. Well, it's a bit of a gray area because uh, the bid price is only held for a certain number of days, and by the time we got the gigantic you know, bind their contract back and forth three times, you know, they were past the point where they had to hold their price. So in order to keep moving, we both signed the contract to keep it going with the understanding that we would review this as change order number one rather than delaying the whole original contract. Basically. Well, and essentially, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, you signed a letter and that they were going to be able to yes. Yes. And we assumed that what other contractors have done at that point in time, when they receive that letter, they order all the materials. Well, I guess these people don't do it. So. They wouldn't order the materials until they had a signed contract with Lewis County. I talked with uh, our engineers on this project and a couple other engineers we work with. What some counties do is they put a notice. When you get your notice of award, they have a paragraph in there that says, this is considered legally binding for 30 days, you know, please get started on ordering materials or something like that so that we don't get caught in this gray area between, you know, bid and um, okay. contract. So we've basically already agreed to pay the 20 some thousand dollars if they can prove their subcontractor costs and stuff. Before. Well, the contract that they sign and we sign says there's a process for change orders and that process includes approval by the board of legislature. So we haven't agreed to anything other than let's not hold up a, a $2 million project over $22,000. Let's get moving and we can address this, you know, down the line. So if we say no, what happens? They won't be very happy, but probably legally nothing. Okay. <laughs> well, it's yeah. one. I, I mean, I feel sorry for them, but we do a lot of business and a lot of contracts and stuff. And I can see us setting ourselves up for cost increases and other things that contracts would get on. Well, they, I agree with this you. Is, they this did is us, they, they, did us, they, did us a, a, they did us a bit of a favor by signing the contract, even though they, they had increases because they didn't want to delay the project under the, you know, agreement that we would look at. So. Well, that's because they're looking at their bottom line on the next project. Well, if they didn't sign the contract till we resolved this, we still wouldn't have a signed contract with CMS and the price would be keep going up by the day. So, but in my opinion, better to sign it and then address this than to keep waiting. This yeah. was a pretty good price, right? Yes, our budget was 1.89 million and the bid came in at 1.23, I think. And what we're trying to do is, you know, be fair, but also what I'm saying, where they were on the bid. So without looking at that, that's what we asked for. And we really didn't commit to anything. Okay. And you know, we want to see what they've got, and if it has escalated, and they were all based on that. You know, the right thing to do is that because you are going up. So you want to put in after we see the proof of the raw bid price. But today you can order for this. Yeah. yeah. And it would hinge by adding that in the motion. Uh, it would allow it to move forward if they meet all the requirements and get the stuff to us that we see. We can continue moving forward. But we got what we pay. Okay. How do you want that word, John? Um, so 
I'll, I'll put a provision in there that they, uh, your, the committee is moving it forward, provided they submit the proof from the original war bid on the cost of these materials and any increases and documentation of increases that they've been given to justify. What we would, what we would really like to see is their quote that they use yeah. from their subcontractor back in February versus the quote that they have now. You go to that, Lisa. Okay, we have a second to that. A second. To All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Okay, uh, the first motion is a motion authorizing Recreation Forestry and Parks Director Jackie Mahoney to put out an RFP for the bathhouse project at Singing Waters. Any questions or discussions? Jackie, what have we got there right now? I know we've done some work over there, but I couldn't tell exactly what's going on. We harvested, cleaned it up. Um, the well's been drilled. It's not connected yet, so the water line and electric has to be taken to the well. The well needs to be certified. The bathhouse and the septic installed yet, um, and the approach on the bridge fixed. The um, fire pits that have been ordered have to be installed. So this is kind of a continuation in what, what we've been doing. Any questions? Um, Dick, so they sign off until we had <coughs> at least plans for the bathhouse. Yeah. Do you have plans for the bathhouse? What's that? Do you have plans for the bathhouse? No, they're being engineered now. How are you going to walk it? It is, you don't have plan. He's yet. supposed to be having them done in the next two weeks. I didn't want to delay the process of waiting another month to go out to bid. Would it be a big issue if we delayed the whole thing for a year? If that's what you guys want to do. Because the cost of materials is probably going to be it's next year, but no, I don't. That's your choice. No, the prediction is it's going to drop back. It'd be nice to at least get the plans. We can go out to bid, doesn't mean you have to accept it. Probably sure. eighteen months ago, there's be enough for the trade right now. They see this place and stuff. There's no stuff. What's committee want to move forward? Postpone it? All right. I mean, when you say move forward, the RFPs. I'm okay with that. Forward. Dick? Yeah, it's good. You know, we got time to. Okay. I'll go for it. Uh, if, if the prices are coming high, you don't have to accept them. Well, I guess I will. Then. Yeah. We can delay it. At least we know where we're at. Maybe there's right. some work on All there. in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Carried. Well, we can hope for is a contractor's got this stuff in his stock. He, he's right. Well, when I had electrical business, I was a stocking guy. So sometimes I had stuff in stock. Are you going to do a direct session now? Or I actually, uh, there's one more motion. Sorry. Um, motion to authorize Sandra Buell, planning director, to read the one full time community development specialist due to resignation effective immediately. Unfortunately, uh, Kevin Bruliard, unfortunately for us, fortunately for him, uh, he's been offered a job with NYSERDA in Albany, and I'd like to think part of the reason is because Lewis County is often leading the way on energy policy across the state, but particularly with our solar policy that we just passed and a lot of that energy irrigation stuff, and um, Kevin has a strong resume on his own, but definitely working hand in glove with uh, the folks in NYSERDA has exposed him, and they've offered him a job, so... Um, he'll be on his way out, and so now we have two openings up there because we have two community development specialists, um, and poor Cassie is going to be without any help for a couple, you know, a month or so. Um, I got to ask a question. I know we do. They're both funded if we put people back on. Yes. Yeah. Is there any other questions? I'll make a motion to allow Cass go ahead. And Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. That's all I have. So, yes, we did want to um, hold an executive session to talk about 
uh, labor negotiations, but if, uh, if the committee and the rest of the board wants to hold that until the, the finance and rules committee we'll do that at the end, that's fine with us. Will be a combined committee discussion, then, is that what you're saying? Yes, we have. Okay. Everybody good for that? Yeah, sounds good. I do have one update, Jerry. Um, CNS is closing in on the end of their work, which is the um, concept phase of our renovation project. They plan on having a report available to you guys, a final report, on June 1st. So their contract says they're supposed to have June, but we've moved right along and we'll, we will have a report to the board on the first. So, what I would like to think about is if we can get the reports you guys early, okay? So, if it goes out with a packet on, say, the 25th, whenever the packet goes out for our board meeting, we might want to think about having some time as a full group to discuss uh, the report and, and what you want to do next because. We don't want to waste a whole lot of time if we're still trying to get design done and get shovels in the ground next spring. Uh, we still want to, you know, keep that moving. So, um, you know, I, I guess the reason I bring it up now is because we could do two things. We could try to push it off to the committee, give the committee a chance to review it, or bring it right to the full board on the, on the first and have a group discussion. I don't know what you guys uh, would prefer to do, but it should be done by the time packets go out um, on the first. So. What's your preference? I don't want to skip over any important committee discussion, but I don't also want to have to wait until June if we've got a direction to go, or excuse me, July if we've got a direction to go forward. So that's kind of what we toss it. I won't be here in the first. Well, if we get it in time, um, and have a chance to well, review it. And ask yeah, questions. I mean, it does from that side. And be a lot three. Quite a possibility that. Okay. If, if we can get it out in the packet, then we'll try to have some discussion. You want to send that to everybody? Everybody, yeah. Okay. yeah. As soon as we get it, we'll send it out to everybody. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there should be really no surprise I'm talking about you know, for the last few months. So. Yes. Oh. And Ryan's included some information and stuff like that. So we've got a little information. We're going to get set up. Um, one question. What is better for the committee? Um, evening? You eat or evening? Yeah. Ryan? I'm pretty much any time. Okay. Good. Unless I'm playing golf. <laughs> Wednesday nights are out. <laughs> okay. Other than that, I guess I'm but that we prefer during the day or in the evening. It would help you on if we did it after what time? Later in the day is better. I mean, I could do by Zoom too if necessary. Okay. That's for that works out well for me. I'll, I'll use the working. The superintendents are <laughs> the, 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 the superintendents are going to have. You know, schedule demands as well. So yeah, you, oh, yeah. you might be looking at after three o'clock for them anyway. So. Okay. I guess that's all we have for today. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Make that motion. I did. Thank you. All in favor, aye. Right?
Peter Ryan. Aye. Opposed. The manager approved. Presentations. Eric, are you ready? Sure thing. Okay, jump right in if you are. Yep. All right, so this is, uh, I, I don't know if sure, Ryan, if we've been doing this for multiple years, but we're trying to do just kind of a 2020 wrap up. Um, it's it's funny, I talk a lot about accountants live in the past, and we've literally been working on 2020 for five months still. So we're pretty much at the end of the process. So for you, what we wanted to do is just give you a you know real high level, here's what the actual results for 2020 were compared to budget, and also have in there compared to last year. Um, if you've had a chance to just at least briefly look through this um, over the last couple of days, I'm going to try and take you through these slides pretty quick. Um, they're showing you kind of on a department by department or a, or a you know multiple department basis what those results were for 2020. Um, I'll, I'll hit a couple of them with a little bit more information, but some of them I'm just going to take a quick look at. If you have questions at any time, feel free to stop me. Um, I'll do the best I can to answer your questions. And if you've got an email, Phil would send me some good questions previously. So. I'll do my best to answer your questions. If I can't give you an answer, I'll try and get back to you. Um, so that's the intent. And hopefully just give you a little bit of information for 2020. First, and again, we Ryan set this format up, I think, a couple years ago, just kind of going through by our, our areas of operation. So this first section is on public safety. Uh, district attorney, you can see there. Um, and we did we combined the coroner under district attorney. So there's two departments, in essence, in our MUNIS system. Um, the revenues were revenues and expenses were both pretty much on budget for 2020. Um, a little bit of growth in expenses versus 2019, but pretty much stayed on budget for last year. Public defender. This this is a, our public defender really is grant funding. So what this department summarizes is revenues from New York State and expenses with those revenues expenses we incur to provide public defender services. We outsource those expenditures to provide public defender services. We don't typically budget revenue um, because it's difficult with the way the state's grants work to know exactly what we're going to have each year. Um, I think in 2020, you'll see that we, um, again, the, the timing of the grants is strange. I mean, the state owes us quite a bit of money, so that's why we had expenses were high, but the revenues were not yet received. So that, I think, will catch up, hopefully, quite a bit in 2021. There you go. 2020. Question. You. That's a pretty good jump there on the expenditures. Mm -hmm. that's, gonna, that's gonna be covered. It's going to continue to jump because of the um, the state change of form. Right? Well, not only that, but our, the state revenue to public defense is doubling every year for five years. So I think there's two years left. Yeah, we we have some county money in there too. It's not free, right? 240, I think. We, we have the two contracts for the Lewis defenders and for the conflict defender. And then we have the third tier of 18B assignments that do not get covered by any of these grants. Right. So and neither do the contracts get so covered by these grants. So we do have out of pocket expenditure. Thank you. Eric, do you mind the other table so you're not blocking the camera? Thank you. <laughs> it was good if the camera saw my back, though, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cassandra. Sheriff's Office. Um, so key things that are highlights there, expenditures were over budget um, and up significant quite a bit in 2019. I wanted to highlight the last line of the salaries and benefits. That's primarily where the excess was, was in, was in salaries and benefits. Overtime then. Overtime, I think uh, I think I did provide some information in the email I sent back out to Phil. I don't have the numbers in my head, but the overtime was um, definitely a big portion of the salary and benefit increases. I think both in dispatch and sheriff. Um, the jail component. 
for the sheriff. And actually a, bit, a little bit lower in both in expenses during the year. Um, Brian, I don't know if you wanted to chime in, but I, I, I might suggest that might be related to a little bit to COVID, but also maybe to the new discovery and bail reform regulations that our census has been down. Yeah, I bet. Uh, I also think that inmate uh, meals were down, so that would speak to low census, lower census. Yeah. So, sheriff's office road patrol up, a little over budget. Sheriff's jail down, under budget. In my mind, we give the sheriff a certain amount to operate. This year, he stayed within that operation. If, if you look at those two, they, and again, I think I put a note in my email, they, they almost offset each other over budget here and under budget in the jail. Um, so as, as Ryan just said, from an overall perspective, um, close, close to balancing the budget. The jail is more static than, you know, than the road control. Certainly not. Um, I would think the jail would have some consistency in operation. I, I think your comment was the sheriff's road patrol more static. I, I would think no, no, be, the jail would be more static. The road patrol would be right. More, I, yeah. I, I'm no expert on their operations, but I would almost think that road patrol could be relatively static. Also, we had another thing is we had vacancies yeah. of yeah. Uh, of uh, corrections officers. Oh, okay. So we had some retirements where you know we're filling positions. I mean, they're all 24/7 operations, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't know why one would be static and one wouldn't. The other wouldn't. You have more events. <sighs> Population's the only mix that I can see in the jail. Yeah, the only variable input is uh, inmates would be medical, food, and overtime. Yeah. Because you know, we're, if we have low census, we don't necessarily need the overtime. The other thing is, um, this big discrepancy is because of we had open positions. Yeah. You had a lot of. Farmed out too. Well, we had a lot of parts. We created a bunch of part time positions a couple years ago and we struggled to keep them built. No, so I mean, we farmed out inmates. So uh, that was two years ago. We we haven't farmed out any this year. So this, yeah, this, oh, was this is 2020. 2020. Yeah. Yeah, we're living in the past, unfortunately. I'm, other questions? Wanted to keep moving, but if you've got other questions, please don't hesitate. Um, probation, I, I won't spend much time on this one. Um, lower budget and expenses, I think, really to those two programs at the bar, bottom, the RTA and the SDSJP, it's just lower activity, probably a good part due to COVID. Emergency bank management, track pretty close with budget. So there's a department that was asked to do more during the pandemic and was still under budget. Yep. Did, did well to manage it very effectively. Codes office, uh, revenue was way up. I think I've got a note there for wind project and treat solar projects. So there's substantial revenue increase, um, slight increase in expenditure. I think they added staff later in 2020. Um, and they also, also one individual, if I recall, had a health insurance, which was not a newer individual which we did not budget for. Does all the wind and solar money go through codes or why does it or just because of their their the permit, permit right. Right. Okay. So, okay. so when the contractor builds they have to have a permit to do their get their job construction. Okay. okay. Moving on to yeah good good revenue. Yeah moving sure. on to health and human services functions uh, community services and I try to pare this down so it's not showing the um, the pass-throughs to all the agencies. So this is really just the LGU revenues and expenses and really nothing unusual there. I think I have a note that the, we did not use some of the federal batch salary sharing. And just because with COVID activity, we didn't, the department didn't get into some other things they probably were planning to. Public health, you know, Definitely an unusual year for them. Uh, some of their primary programs really just had very limited activity in public health. So their the revenues were way down, their expenses were way down. Um, and you know, most of their COVID expenses, I want to say were free, but the, the government provided 
the expense, the, the funding to carry on their, a lot of their COVID activities. Ashley, is that? Yeah, pre K services were also down for the year, which is a huge significant yeah. budget. Yep. Where did we get all the help that was helping <coughs> public health out? We built it through public health, but so like some, Eric, Eric said, we had offsetting revenue for that. One of the biggest programs that we run, health and human wise, is the pre K program. And we didn't want any kids or, you know, nobody could go to school. So we saved them a lot of money on pre K. And that kept us under budget here. Yeah. So even though we, we spent more personnel wise at public health than we probably will in the next 20 years, we still spent, spent less programmatically. And I think a lot of the personnel came in later in 2020. Yeah. I don't know. It was, I bet it was November yeah. before you really started to hire additional staff. Yeah. yeah. So we didn't catch a lot of the expense. Yeah. That seems like a long yeah. time ago. I, I would think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. You know, we're, we're living in the past. Sorry about that. <laughs> DSS, I would say a similar effect. A lot of their typical activity was lower than usual. Um, so some of the, the revenue was down, and, and a lot of their program expenses were, were not normal, so they did not incur some of those normal expenses. Another big item you see down there in the notes is the IGT, um, and I, I had to look back. I, I haven't refreshed my memory on that, but we just we were in a situation with the IGT where we we had credits built up from earlier years, so we they, we didn't get the IGT funding for the hospital and nursing home, so we didn't. We didn't have to pay out the county. Didn't have to pay out. In 2016, remember we had to pay that, or 17, we paid that huge catch-up payment, like eight million dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, now they do the same thing where they do a retro catch-up for the last five years, and we came out on the good side of this. Time. Um, I have a question. I know it's not my committee, but the Department of Social Services is. Why is foster care revenue down? Revenue down. I would think that would stay the down. same. We didn't. We didn't have as many kids come through our programs or anything. No. There, there were not a lot of neglect proceedings that okay. happened okay. for a number of months. Because okay, okay. I get it. Thanks. Thank you. It's, you know, just going back through through public health and DSS. When you know, when you look at the bottom line for 2020. Um, Revenues were down significantly, expenses were down significantly, and really those two departments were probably the key drivers to that. Government is not, I like to explain it like this, government's not like a business. The more we do does not mean the more revenue we bring in. The more we do, the more it costs us. We, didn't, we had a very busy year last year, but we didn't do a lot of programs. So that's reflected in our finances here. We saved a lot of money. OFA is next, and again, similar, I think, activity. They were down in revenue, down in expenses for, um, I would say, the same same logic, just that COVID changed their activity. Their staff spent a lot of time working on COVID, so you know, their staff expenses were not down, but they were not getting the normal program revenues or spending money on their normal programs. They're, they were spending their time in, to a great extent assisting with a public health emergency. Public services, county clerk, not a lot of comments there. Mortgage tax revenue is way up. I think their DMV clerks and clerks revenue were down. Um, expenses were down a little bit, mostly due to benefits, lower compensation. Highway department, the, the big, there's decreases there, both revenue expenditures, expenditures, I think primarily due to chips. We talked about earlier, decreased by the state, we spent our money differently. That's, that's the decreases we see there in the highway. Machinery, um, I'm not sure that that's specifically related to chips, but just, yeah, maybe less, less project work occurred in, in 2020. Solid waste, um, a couple of key notes there. You can see the revenue is up substantially both from last year, about 200 budgeted. Um, and I think if you, you probably heard, I mean, people were just obviously using the facility more in 2020. Um, 
Expense is really a key item. I think I've got in the note there's a $329,000 charge that is calculated by our auditors related to, um, we'll hear more about this from our auditors later in the year, They're the long-term pension benefits. It's called other post-retirement and employee benefits. It's just a calculated number. It's not something that solid waste controls. Um, so that's, I think, and when you look at that, don't look at that and say, oh, solid waste lost money. It's just, a, it's a number that they had to recognize from an audit perspective. And we purchased a bunch of equipment last year to prepare for the new open top system. Yes. So that was part of that as well. Right, there are additional expenses definitely that they incurred using their own funds. What kind of an impact, I'm just curious, <coughs> with the stock market being involved in this, I've never seen that. That's that's the, a big piece of it, Ron. And again, I'll, I'll, our auditors will probably talk more about that when they come and, and walk you through our audit. But they this calculation of our retirement and health insurance benefits and the retirement maybe <coughs> being even the biggest factor is based on uh, the state's fiscal year and a month. So they were calculating numbers based on March of 2020 when the stock market hit at the end of March. So that's a huge factor. Our, both Southeast and the county in general, this retirement number went through the roof. It, is that uh, for solid waste, the primary additional expense, 329000 Is that what Gatsby 45? I believe so, Eric. Uh, I don't know all my Gatsby's, Jerry, but it's it's related to other retirement benefits. Well, we're going to all in the future. Yes, exactly. you got to track it right. and sort of account for it. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Thank you. The way the way I talk about it, you maybe have heard this way before. If we if we close tomorrow, what would we theoretically have to pay for years to come for our retirees and for our health insurance? Our enterprise funds have to carry their portion of that liability. Right. So the hospital shows. $110 million as their portion of that liability. Our solid waste portion is only. Thank you. Recreation, forestry, trails, and parks. And I, and I consolidated all of those into this one screen, one slide. Um, really tracked pretty well with budget last year. Um, trail permit sales were up a decent amount in 2020. Um, so that's a note you see there. Real property, they're one of our normally pretty stable departments. Their expenses and revenues are pretty consistent. Board of Elections, same thing. Their revenue was uh, some federal CARES Act funding, but their expenses were quite consistent with normal operations. Veterans, same thing. Not a lot of change from year to year in veterans. Uh, weights and measure was down a little bit. I think another good question from Phil. I think uh, part of that reduction is rolling over into 2020, 2021. So just a bill that we have not yet received. We'll catch that up this year. Planning department had a lot of grant activity, so their numbers um, seem a little, definitely higher than normal. A lot of it's just some of those ongoing grants for the BOA, the, the water, state water grants. I think I, the note at the bottom there, their regular departmental expenses were down some, like probably due to staff transitions. Community college line, if you recall, this is what we pay out for Lewis County students going attending community colleges in other counties throughout the state and had a significant flip in 2019. And I really don't know exactly what caused that, but it kind of backed down to a more normal number in 2020. Our administrative departments. I, Eric, can you go back to the column for a second? I would, would have a slightly different analysis. I think that 16, 17, 18, 19 is a trend yeah. across the state going upwards. 20 was an anomaly year because of COVID. The admissions were down. I think we need to continue to budget high for this because I think it's going to come back in 2022, 2023, and you're going to be 
continuing expense that continues to go up. Yeah. Good point, and I, I'd have to look at 2021 budget, but I do think we increased 2021 budget a little bit. We've increased every year that I've been. Yeah. If you had a class of students who skipped going to college for a year, you're going to see a surge for Great. next year. We too. might have actually, we might have more than a you know a makeup year. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and take a look at that one and see where we're at this year. At this point, this year. Uh, IT department uh, actually down a little bit again. I think staff transitions reduced some of their expenses in 2020. <laughs> Building and grounds expenses were down some. I think again we're kind of continuing to see that trend. Some of their good portion of their expenses are through our solar system, and we are continuing to see the benefits of solar compared to what we budgeted. Our budget is still. Maybe not adjusted for that. Benefits of it. HR down a little bit of expenses, probably staff transitions again. Yeah. <coughs> Caitlin's assistant position was vacant half the year. I'm vacant here. County attorney, usually over budget by a lot, but not too bad. Not as bad as the next one. Um, so, yes, no, no one's really unusual activity in the county attorney's office. I don't know, from a financial perspective. Um, we yeah, yeah. We <laughs> run because we budgeted for some more labor negotiations with the outside council, and this didn't happen until yeah. it didn't happen. Treasurer's office usually pretty consistent and no, nothing <clears throat> unusual in 2020. County manager, uh, a little over wow, budget. Perfect budget. <laughs> <laughs> we should get him to sell peanuts or something, give him the revenue. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, some revenue generation from that department would not be a bad idea. <laughs> I'll think about that for next year's budget. <laughs> I, I, I save money with a stroke of a pen. Again, spend it, right? That's, that's why Cassandra goes to give me any plans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the clerk of the board, was, uh, expenses were down quite a bit with staff changes. Uh, health insurance lower than it had been in the past. Legislative was down. Um, I think that was some of, you know, uh, maybe the tax surety account, um, some of your accounts that we might budget for, but if you didn't, if we didn't have need for the funds. Contingency, is that enough? No, contingency, we usually kind of pull that out. So that's not usually a factor. Non-departmental, I wanted to just highlight here some other, um, other items that are not, are not in a specific account. and. Some of these, you know, we've talked about obviously the sales tax revenue was strong. We, we keep track of that. Um, our pilot revenues were pretty much where we expected for 2020. Um, surprisingly, the casino revenue, um, our tax sale for so the property tax process and the penalties, um, those were all relatively consistent. Um, and then the shared service expense, and again, Phil had a question on this. That's, I'm going to call that a Three hundred seventeen thousand dollars expense. I'm going to call that accounting, but really it is. It's it's looking back at um, some balance sheet items that have just been sitting there, kind of building up. And uh, part of my logic for 2020 was to try and check, take a look at those and and get them off of our balance sheet if it made sense, and worked with our auditors to do that. Where's the casino revenue coming? Casinos, people, people like you. That, um, <laughs> we have a where's a casino? I guess we, that's my question. We get um, attorneys don't. We get an allocation from the state um, surrounding counties. I'm not exactly sure the exact law or process, Ron, but surrounding counties get an allocation um, from. I think casinos in their region. Um, ours is pretty low. You know, if you look at. Oneida County, obviously they're with the casino located Okay, there. I just didn't realize you got any money from that yep. source. Yep, and it was down initially in 2020 with, because of COVID, but it, it, it got back to normal by the end of the year. 
Uh, this page just kind of is kind of a summary of our. This is general fund only. So looking at totals from a revenue and expense perspective, um, and again our our revenues were really not that far um, off of what we expected. You know we had higher revenues in sales tax. We just saw the significantly lower revenues in. Um, you see that below in, in public health and, and DSS. Um, on the expense side, significantly under budget, as we, as we talked about, because so many departments really were not, did not have their normal activities. Um, and a listing in there on the bottom or right is some of those major impacts of the departments that really had the largest changes. And then the, the last page is just a summary of our fund balance. And again, we talked, we highlighted a couple times with, with that year end result for 2020, our fund balance will, will increase significantly. Um, so that's just a, a summary and a highlight of that. So we're up to about a $14 million. Um, that is our unreserved. So there are there are different components of fund balance, and I'll I'll see if when our auditors come, we can kind of walk through that a little bit more. It's it's complicated, but the fourteen million is what we would call unreserved. We don't, um, and I think the, the easiest thing I would explain is I think it's in the note in italics. So the one the one million six hundred fifty thousand that we've committed to the twenty twenty one budget is part is a reserved piece of the fund balance. So take the fourteen million and add to one point six in. Yeah, starts that moves you to the total fund balance of 17 million. So just think of the 14 million as money that's available. I think that's the last slide. You sleep with us tonight. You got any other questions? Don't hesitate to let me know. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What is that? It's my car bill. What number is it so I can call you? Well, it says right on here. Maybe Great job. They won't call me. That's my sound. Do you have to be on silent? I don't know. No, I can put it on silent. <laughs> My wife isn't for me. Marcus of the aging is going to work. What the hell was that? Moving along, Connor. Uh, four. I've been a lot of a couple minutes because I would like to, uh, I guess, I'll start off by saying that I'd like to move to an RFP for the Lewis County website. And I'll give you a couple reasons why. Um, looks terrible. Yeah, it looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and done. Uh, so the first point is that uh, a website is a, is a place that any Lewis County resident or anybody who's curious about Lewis County uh, government in general, you can get to it anytime, anywhere. It's available, unlike buildings and this clerk's offices. Sometimes these offices close down because of COVID or whatever. A website is always open. People can get to resources whenever they need to. And People should have access to their government resources. Uh, transparency, kind of in vain. Um, I think it's part of our government's responsibility to be as transparent as possible with our public information, how we're spending our money, um, <coughs> in the communities. So a website is a great place to showcase what we are doing with the taxpayer dollars, as well as making sure that there's, you know, people can see and, and not be questioning what's happening with, with their money here in local government. Website is neat, like I said, right along with accessibility, it's, it's right there. And, and we're, we're putting it out to them, and it kind of flips the whole foil concept um, around. Instead of people coming to us and foiling us for, for details and information, we're just saying, Here it is, it's on the website, go find it. Um, we kind of do a little bit of that today, but I think the organization on our current website is a little bit tough, it's not easy to navigate. So we have room to improve. I think the current website was a big step forward for the county five years ago. Um, but let's take the next step and let's create something that our community, community can celebrate or, or they can look at it and say and be proud of. 
our website and, and actually want to go there to find resources or yeah. I hear people that, that go to News Junkie and these other websites and they're willing to go to, to these websites that are really they're full of information but they really don't look that good. Imagine if we had a, a nice website that looked good and had relevant information about what's happening in the county uh, and provided the information that they needed. So key updates for the for the website if we put out to RFP would be Let's organize our information a little bit better. Let's make it easier for our departments to publish information, as well as for people to be able to find it, whether it's budget information or directories for our different departments. Um, um, same idea, easy updates. I'd like it, our departments to be able to go and make updates whenever they need to on their department pages. Um, they don't necessarily need to go to IT or an outside organization for those changes. However, I'd like whoever it is that's doing a website to be available to us um, should we need to make those changes. And modern access and design. So there's a modern principle with websites um, and it's accessibility. So people that are blind or deaf should be able to, to access any of our information on our website just like someone who doesn't have any of those um, <laughs> hindrances. So there are ways of developing websites that people using screen readers um, can connect properly, consume the information, or people that, um, if we have video content, making sure that we have some, trying to get subtitles and closed captioning on our videos. Um, whatever web developer we go with, we want to make sure that they are advising us properly as far as that accessibility, and then just having a, a good design um, for the modern age. So our current website doesn't look that great on, on mobile devices, but a lot of people are uh, searching the web on our mobile devices, even around here, I saw them on the internet on this phone. So uh, we wanted to look it on uh, whatever device we're using. So, and that pretty much concludes uh, my quick presentation. But the idea is, I'd like to, I'd like us to go forward with an RFP and, and try to, um, you know, up the ante here with our website. For me, it's it's a big investment. It's there's there's a there's an investment, but it's a small cost for such a big community impact. So. What is the approximate cost? Uh, I believe last time we went out, we paid fourteen thousand for the initial design, and we pay about two thousand a year for hosting. I don't think it should cost that much. Um, I know that it could. There are a couple of local vendors that could probably do it uh, for cheaper. Right now, we go with a very big national company, and they don't provide a lot of on-the-spot support for bigger issues with the site. So if I did an RFP, I'd be looking locally as well as nationally to try to get a competitive bid price-wise and service-wise. So. Okay. Do you need a motion? Mm -hmm. If you guys want to, you can make a motion. Motion to vote for an RFP. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? I, I was just going to say, I'd like it if, and this is down the road, but when we do get it, if Connor ultimately has creative control over how it really looks, and because I like what he said, but if we do give it to another company, they may come up with something that's different from what we have in mind about design, but I, I agree with every point you make. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> We're going to go along with that. We're kind of agreeing to the cost of about. 14,000 as well, I would imagine, because otherwise there's no sense in doing it. Take it out of contingency. We have uh, funds in the Reserve. capital data process. Fine. Yeah. yeah, but I don't think uh, an initial design, redesign should cost 14. That, I think that was high to begin with five years ago. Um, yeah, I think they're kind of selling us a product that we weren't really. Yeah, they were they were overselling us on something. So I think if we go with them with very um, specific requirements for our RFP, it'll be easier to rein in those costs for the initial design as well as having a realistic year-to-year -year hosting cost for our website. Don't forget, last time we went from like 1998 beta to modern. This yeah. time we needed to we got a lot of data and print already up there. We got. Just move it a little bit further. Forward. And I meant when I said when that that five years ago that investment I think was well worth it. I think that was a great step forward. And I think there's just there's still room to improve to take us to that next level. So okay. Anything else? 
All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, the first docket is resolution authorizing memorandum of understanding with the County of Lewis and Lewis County Solid Waste Department, wherein the county agrees to advance the sum of up to $1.5 million from the general fund to solid waste for the Wobble Transfer Station upgrade project in consideration of solid waste agreement to repay the county for the funds advance. Any questions or comments? What's the payback anticipated? Some of the years? 20 years, 1.5% interest. Okay. However, I will say that we plug those numbers in fully intending to have a discussion, whatever you guys think is appropriate. Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's three factors in my mind. One is, and you talked about this quite some time ago, but how much funding do we think makes sense for solid waste to put into the project? And I think today we're estimating 400,000. If the project comes in at 1.9 million, um, and the general fund would put in 1.5. So that's one factor. The other factor, I think Ryan just mentioned, one is the interest rate at 1.5%, and two is the time period of 20 years. You know, you could you could go higher or lower on either of those factors. I think those make sense for 1.5 and 20. The 20, the 1.5 and 20 was based on uh, an, an annual payment of, I believe, $90,000. So we felt that that was a level that the solid waste fund could manage to pay back. But I would just add that we have had discussion, especially when I was meeting with you guys one-on-one -on -one about um, using the fund balance of solid waste. It's an enterprise fund and they don't currently have cash flow problems. So I personally feel comfortable if we drew that fund balance from 800,000, 850, all the way down to around 200. That's a little more than what I felt, uh, I heard other people were comfortable with. So if we kept it at 300, 350, that would make people feel more comfortable. So that reflects kind of those discussions. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on that? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. <clears throat> Resolution to waive health insurance premiums payable by the county as employer for all active employees for the month of July 2021. Questions, comments, concerns? This was a, a catch up from before. Correct. We did an employee only holiday back in 2019. We did not to the employer earlier this year, employee and an employer holiday. This is now bringing the employee contribution and the employer contribution, even they both had the same number. Of That's the goal. So just a, a more broad note here on our health insurance for a minute. It's true that our fund balance is high. Yes, our fund balance for our self-insured fund is at a high level. However, health insurance costs, with the exception of 2020, because then we went to the doctor, but at an insurance costs are going up five to seven percent. Okay. So yes, we have a high fund balance. But our strategy at this point is to allow the, in, the, the rapid increase in health care costs to come up and meet the fund balance so it comes back down to an appropriate level. So there's been some discussion about amongst employees that I think has gotten out into the community and with the legislators about um, the county kind of taking a position that we feel our current PPO plan, the union negotiated health care plan, is quote unquote unsustainable. And how can we say it's unsustainable if it has a fund balance of $8 million? Well, yes, the fund balance in the short run is high, and we believe over the next five, 10 years, it'll come back down to normal levels. 
However, it doesn't change the fact that in the long run, the other post-employment benefits like Eric was just talking about with solid waste, that same application goes to the hospital. Their portion is $110 million. Tomorrow, the county would have to, over the next 30 years, pay $110 million for all those employees that are retired from the hospital. So when we talk about unsustainable, we're talking about an expense that makes so that makes the hospital uncompetitive uh, with other hospitals in our region. And we're talking about an ongoing liability that continues to grow as retired. We have more retirees that continue to live longer. And the employment at the hospital becomes more efficient. We're not having as many employees as we have. So this is an ongoing issue. We're talking about long-term sustainability. Yes, we built up a fund balance that's going to be beneficial to us. 10 years, but that still doesn't change the fact that we have this gigantic liability that's sitting on our balance sheets at the hospital. So that is what we mean when we're going into union negotiations, when we're talking to employees about long-term unsustainability, we're talking about that overhead liability. Any questions? Or comments on that any further? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Resolution amending compensation plan of the County of Lewis with reference to Lewis County General Hospital to create one full-time purchasing agent position and one part-time <coughs> stores clerk position. This uh, would have came forward from Health and Human Services and we went in the right order. Questions, comments? <laughs> All in favor, aye. <laughs> aye. Opposed? Carried. Um, and then I'm going to skip number four because that they made a motion to take that. Yeah. Um, I do have a motion that came forward from General Services Committee, which was a motion to authorize Planning Director Cassandra Beal to refill one full-time community development specialist position due to resignation effective immediately. Questions, concerns? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Oh, that's a motion, so I just need someone to make it. Inside. I'll make that motion. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Second grade. I'll still second it. Second. I'll still okay, thank you. We'll come back to the Oh, actually, there is one more thing. Um, sorry. We. Uh, would like to get a motion to put forward a resolution at the June meeting. Um, we contracted with uh, CNS, right? No. Yes. Yeah, yeah. CNS. Um, this is this is the CNS. Oh, yes, go ahead. Sorry. For the new building project, they were going to do uh, this, this study, kind of. Um, where is that being paid from? We haven't set up a project account yet for the renovation project. Typically, we set aside a project account. We wanted to do the uh, concept phase to kind of get an idea of what the budget's going to be and how we're going to go forward. Well, the concept phase still costs us money. We've got to pay for that money. So we can either set up a project account, a big capital account, or we can uh, take it out of contingency. It's uh, forty thousand dollars now, but I believe the entire contract was around hundred thousand. One hundred fourteen. One hundred fourteen. One fourteen four sixty. You got any contingency, haven't you? We do. Yep. Figure it out later. I think for tracking clarity reasons, it would be easier just to set up a capital fund now and then draw on it and then. I didn't know we're going forward with the captive project. That hasn't come out to a vote yet. I think that that is kind of a key point. It would make more sense if we're going to move forward to pay the CNS, the, the planning and design, as part of the capital. Um, I, I don't know that I can give you a recommendation on, given where we are today, is as we like have we have said. we have a capital account with over eight hundred thousand dollars in it that we've been preparing for building project, so we could take out of that as well. Right. So there's money available. Um, 
it's at some point we're going to technically need to set up a capital project. Possible. Right. Right. I guess my thoughts are we take it out of that capital account that we got right now and we work out of that for now. So I, I think a, a motion just so we can authorize the expenditure, maybe a motion to use the reserve okay. to pay the expenditure. I'll make that motion that we use our capital account money for this expense to get things rolling. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Motion to adjourn by the roof committee. So, I'm going to keep it. Second. We're gonna we're gonna hold an executive session um, later after, after the other meeting. So Ron, you made the motion. <laughs> or did you make the motion? I did not, but I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Committee's adjourned.
Are they ready to begin? Okay. Okay. I need a motion to accept the minutes from our last meeting. Can I have a second? Bill. Okay, and I think we're ready for our people who are going to present, right? So, so are you going to introduce? Oh, I would. I'll introduce Pat. You can introduce. Okay. But what I would like to say is that it's a little different than we haven't done in the past. But we were talking in our pre-agenda meeting, and then we brought Andrea in about. Um, Instead of more of a, a formal presentation, more of a free-flowing conversation with experts in our community about mental health. Um, it's a topic that is getting a lot of discussion in the community in light of recent events and in light of the fact that everybody's been locked inside and stressed out for about 18 months. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Pat. And uh, this is a free discussion. Please, anybody, you know, chirp in, chime in, have comments, questions. So thank you, um, as I don't know Brian said, but um, in addition to that, May is mental health. Uh, so it's an opportunity to um, raise the awareness and, and work on stigma and people form. So I want to thank the committee for an opportunity for us to be able to speak today in regards to the mental health services of the county. Um, and certainly, as Ryan indicated, the pandemic has certainly um, had a, a huge impact on the service needs and the delivery in the past year or so. Um, recently, in addition to us being worried about the impact of, um, of COVID on our community, both um, in the school systems or, or at home and whatnot, um, Office of Health has obviously been monitoring that um, over the course of the year, with asking for information and keeping them updated with the idea to determine what if needs needs to be added permanently or one of the things that we don't have to necessarily continue to do. Um, and crisis, um, crisis services has been a big focus on that in the past year. Um, so that's something else that we've been tracking in regards to how that um, impacted our delivery of walk-in and telephone crisis. Um, well, Saver is certainly been keeping track of that for us. Um, so anyway, um, just to kind of <coughs> plant some seed for a later discussion, um, in addition to all my mates worried about crisis services in response to that, um, several of the county department heads have uh, expressed some concerns about the needs and the response to that, and I think it's something that, you know, we'll be bringing back to the committee at a later date um, for future planning and whatnot, including also the Office of Wellness staff. Um, so anyway, I want to take a minute and introduce our panel members, um, and I'm going to start with Maureen Keene, who is the Executive Director of Transitional Living, um, and then Mer Melanie Saber, who is the Clinic Director at Behavioral Health and Wellness, and Melanie Bush, who is the Homeschool Community Coordinator for South Lewis Schools. Um, in addition to the services that they get paid to provide for us and, and are committed to serving the community, um, a lot of things are, are done on their own time, above and beyond the services, and I do want to acknowledge and recognize that. Um, the support of Maureen, Maureen with her staff in regards to the Suicide Prevention Coalition, um, and then the Community Response Team, which is also supported by Ashley um, and uh, Public Health. Um, so again, uh, really kind of looking at beyond what our county could benefit from. So anyway, um, that's really all I have to say. Um, I did ask the committee if they wanted to um, uh, talk a little bit about what questions they might have. So I'm going to start with that. Um, and I know each of them um, brought some information that I think you might be, find beneficial. So initially, um, Phil had asked about what effect has COVID had particularly in regards to depression? I can be on. Thanks. Um, Phil, thanks for the question. It's been a really long time. It's good to see you. Um, actually, it's good to be seen. <laughs> you can see people I know. Um, I didn't really have the ability to drill down statistical information to you know the level right at the county, but I did uh, look at some recent information um, at a national level that was gathered by the Census Bureau that goes back to 
uh, December of 2020. So this is still relatively uh, fresh information. The incidence of uh, symptoms of anxiety or uh, depressive disorder by age in adults uh, at a national level. In adults ages 18 to 24, more than 56 percent of the folks that they surveyed acknowledged having had these <laughs> symptoms in December of last year. Uh, when you look at that age group of folks that are just graduating from high school, folks that are had maybe gone into college and all of a sudden, you know, they were forced to stay home from college. And there are also people that are really, really tied to their social uh, connections. So actually, they were the hardest hit of all of the adult age groups. Uh, next, at the ages of 25 to 49, uh, there was 49, almost 50% of those folks in that age group uh, acknowledged having uh, concerns with anxiety or depressive, depression during COVID. In the next age group, at 50 to 64, we're starting to decline a little bit further now, uh, 31, per, 39, pardon me, percent of those folks uh, uh, had experienced symptoms. And finally, with the older adults, uh, ages 65 and over, it was less than a third of those at 29%. Um, you know, that age group may be a little bit more uh, used to a level of social isolation. Um, but certainly the, the pandemic um, has exacerbated it um, for, for many people and definitely across all age groups. One of the things I'd like to point out before we talk about um, more of the things that have happened, um, and I think I'll, I'll kick off to Mel about this, we actually can't tell you what the impact here is locally on the folks we haven't met. So there, there isn't a way for us to really necessarily gauge what is out there that has not yet uh, connected in somehow, uh, some way with the system, either through um, getting in, uh, you know, making a crisis contact, reaching out for support through the clinic, um, having um, uh, problems with SUD, um, you know, maybe even um, a, uh, a visit to the emergency room at the hospital or having some sort of contact uh, with the police. These are all things that might happen to draw somebody into the system and have a first contact. But we're absolutely positive that there are plenty of people out there that are trying to deal with concerns on their own and have not yet presented in any way, shape, or form to the system. Well, I know you wanted to talk about how things might present. Could I, yes. could I just interrupt you and ask? Yes, sir. So these percentages were for strictly for isolation? No, these percentages are were derived from a, pop, a nationwide population of adults um, in December of last year, um, aging in range from 18 to uh, over 65. And this was uh, information that was gathered by the US Census Bureau. So it was specifically asking them about what sorts of, if they had experienced depression symptoms or anxiety symptoms as a result of COVID. So in a normal year other than COVID, what would those percentages be? I'm not, I mean, we have focused so much on COVID that I'm I guess I don't, understand. I know you're asking about the baseline the and variations. I'm sorry, I don't know, maybe you know more. I've got some more um, specific to local, like within our clinic data with the crises and the impact that we saw from prior to 2020 and then 2020 and current. So. I'm curious because I know historically the younger groups have always been more prone to depression <coughs> issues or episodes than older people. So I'm just wondering what the variation is long term versus this pandemic temporary thing. 
So within our clinic, like more down here for the local level in 2019, if needed, break it out further into the age groups. But in 2019, we had a total of 344 crisis calls, crisis walk-ins in comparison to 448 during 2020. So we had an increase of 104 crises calls, walk-ins. Um, and I can certainly, if needed, down by age group, as well as client versus non-client. So definitely a significant increase in the use of crisis services. Yeah, roughly 25%. We might be able to get an answer to that from him, from Ashley's public health information. We can send an answer back on that okay. as to what baseline might be. We'll share that through Pat. Okay. So it might be interesting is uh, maybe you guys meld, you know, you're on the ground. Um, and we definitely want to talk about students as well. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe give us an overview of what happens. Somebody's at home, they start feeling overwhelmed, they think, I need services. What happens and what level of services are available to our community? So anybody, client or non-client, can always utilize our services 24-7. During the day, they can walk in or they can call, and they are transferred to a licensed clinician um, at that time. And if it's after hours, it is one of our own clinicians on site um, that answers the on-call crisis phone. So if it's a patient, we are typically, as a team at the clinic, we are all already aware of that client, which is great. It's not like sent out and bounced back or anything. Um, and then if it's a non-client, we offer the services. And at that point, because we do everything electronically, we're able to initiate a referral and get them scheduled for further follow-up assessments if they prefer. So I think that's the part that we hear about is yes you've been made a referral but i mean 30 sec 30 minutes ago you were in crisis now you've got a referral for an appointment six weeks from now i mean can you talk about that you know what how, how long does it take to the referrals and you know so currently we don't have a wait list um we definitely triage any referrals that come through uh, I review in-house with my office manager, depending on the acuteness and the urgency of it. We escalate them right in and we can get people in. Um, recently, we've gotten people in within the same week, within the next two weeks. It depends on the need and the level of urgency. Um, we do have, we did bring on more staffing actually recently as well. Um, so we have another full-time therapist and another nurse practitioner who has just returned back from deployment. So um, getting people in much quicker will definitely be much easier to. So if you are presented with a possible suicide case, what's the what's the procession there? Are they you know, how long does it take before they actually mm -hmm. receive treatment or so it, it depends on how they come to us in what form and by that I mean um, if it was a suicide attempt Typically, they're coming to us from a hospital discharge, in which case we have them in within anywhere from one day to five days and begin safety planning, starting services. Um, the assessment process uh, is kind of ongoing. We have our formal forms that we use, like the whole comprehensive assessment, psychiatric evaluation, but they're already in receiving services, having a safety plan put in place within that one to five days after discharge. So that would be the same for, say, in my case, I, I felt severely depressed and I called your office and said I'd like to speak to someone, how long would it be before um, you know, I was actual, actively followed or treated? With. You would be, depending again on the urgency, if it's severely depressed, we would look to get you in as soon as we could, but you'd be scheduled with our um, intake coordinator. And if you needed to be in sooner based on urgency, we would schedule you with one of our other clinicians. However, if you had called at that moment, you would be provided at that moment. Crisis services intervention start right at that moment. Over the phone, essentially, right? Yep, or if they walk in, then it would be face-to-face -face and we can start the safety planning as well. Now, what would happen if somebody reached out and um, was actively suicidal with a plan? We would work to get a pickup order in place, depending on the situation. So it, it depends. It, we, each situation is very unique. 
Um, it depends on the location of the person. It depends like if they're in school, if they're at home with a parent guardian, what the case may be. Um, we would work to, so if it's a younger child that's suicidal or actively suicidal, we would <coughs> ask to speak with the parents. We would make sure the parents are able to get them typically to Samaritan. And if not, then we would work to issue a pickup order. Um, if they're at school, we make sure that they have 20, like eyes on them 24 seven at that case until we're able to get transportation set. Um, we try not to do the pickup orders for younger children as it could be very traumatic. So if we have parent and uh, them to the Samaritan, we go that route as well. What is a pickup order? Is that law enforcement or something? Yep. Okay. So if somebody's calling and they are actively suicidal or have a plan, um, and they don't have any way to get to the hospital, or if they are not safe being transported to the hospital um, by a family member, then we would work with law enforcement to initiate a pickup order. So those people are actually talking about what they might do. So I feel kind of but, um, my heart breaks for these families. So this apparently was something that wasn't thought out. There were no signs of it being thought out. Is of what they did to themselves. I'm sorry, I'm not sure about the reason. Um, yeah. We probably can't say yeah. specifically, it's unknown. specifically that. It's unknown. But, but yeah. Andrea's got it. What happens if, you know, so you're talking about someone who's explicit. What about these folks? So, so there's a certain amount of people that it's a split second decision. There's not time to. And I think that might be kind of that situation that we are not aware of if they're not reaching mm -hmm. out, right. um, if they're not coming mm -hmm. to our clinic or calling our clinicians, we're unaware of what's going on. The other piece of that is they're not, in order to do a pickup order or request for their evaluation, it's not just the active suicidal ideation plans or discussion that they have, it's imminent risk to self or others in general. Mm -hmm. So even if they're not actively stating that, if we still feel that there are a potential risk, something's just not matching up, we can still initiate that. And we typically do. And if we're unclear, we will often work with law enforcement and we'll do welfare checks as a first base. This way, rather than sending law enforcement to do a full transport, we'll have them go do a welfare check um, and then kind of report back to us what they're seeing. There's an impulsivity factor involved also with youth, and I can explain this in kind of like lay people terms because I don't have all the, the clinical training that the real mental health experts have. Um, when you were a kid and you broke up with somebody, it was going to be the end of the world, right? Um, all the, We experience so many things when we're younger as if that, you know, we at that point, we are still the center of the world. The world, um, all you know, our executive things and, and that allow us to see ourselves as part of the world aren't really fully developed until we're more of a, a young adult around 24 or stuff. Uh, so, um, the ability to act on something that just um, crosses our mind without as much of a plan is just greater in a younger person. So, in, in thinking about Andrea's question to you, I'm wondering, from the education side, if there if there are things that you do to alert parents, uh, friends, other relatives of somebody who seems is going through a hard time and in crisis, to help them maybe identify some behaviors or um, conduct that would help to recognize something so that they don't get to that split second point, if that's even possible. I think there's a lot of, and even going forth, education. Um, we have uh, some trainers here in the area um, through the Suicide Prevention Coalition mm -hmm. to offer QPR. And I know um, a couple of schools have really taken that on and um, requested the training. And part of QPR will allow you to identify some of those preparatory behaviors 
that most people wouldn't necessarily recognize. You know, maybe grades are slipping, maybe they opted to skip practice a couple of nights, things that are just outside of the norm. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would definitely elaborate on that. Um, school is just such an amazing place in terms of you have all eyes, so many different set of eyes on these kids at different dynamics and levels. You know, the coaches, the lunch monitors, the aides, just so many set of eyes. And I think uh, that's what I'm so passionate about, about being in the school, because I think that that's a fantastic place to really kind of hone in on the safety of these, these children. Um, you know, on our end, we've been working really hard at South Lewis to build as many resources within the district as we can, because we do recognize often kind of reaching out into the community, um, especially during the time of the pandemic, whether it be transportation barriers, whether it be um, different family members that kind of create the struggle to get to the appointments. Um, I think as many supports and services that can be implemented right within the district is is so critical again because it's a different set of eyes looking at things at a different angle um seeing the student as more than just the, the child that maybe is struggling academically well why is this academic issue there or why is this behavior there i mean i think mel and i had a chance to kind of speak over the weekend on the different presentations um that depression and anxiety come out and it's just so many different levels you know um that over behavior that you think you might see automatically, like the withdrawal or the sadness or the weepy. I mean, it's just, there, it takes on so many different levels. And I think the amazing part, like she was mess or stating about the, the QPR and, and just kind of drawing you into the other pieces of behavior. Just, I think the biggest thing is there's just, there's no wrong thing to look at. If there's something in something's not quite right, or something's a little bit different, explore it, you know, ask the questions. And then once you ask those questions, which the QPR training is phenomenal in that it teaches you just the right um, kind of questions to ask and how to get those next answers. And then to determine, okay, what are the next steps we're gonna go from there? Because I think, you know, in terms of what you're saying, that impulse decision, um, if we can intervene before that and just give some of those different coping strategies or just let them know, hey, there's these other people out here, all these different people you can go to. It just needs to be kind of that one line of support that just somebody that can pause them long enough to really go through what's running through their mind and to come up with some different ideas to just prevent that split second, have you? Um, and I, I, I think, again, the schools have tried so hard to do those things um, and collaborate. I am so grateful to have behavioral health and wellness. Um, at South Lewis, you know, we have we have behavioral health and wellness. We have um, Ruben Salt, Knudsen and Associates. Uh, my position that just began um, in 2019, the Homeschool Coordinate, Coordination Program. It's been such a privilege to be able to go into the homes of these families because, again, I could be going in for a variety of different reasons. A lot of times it's attendance that initiates it, but then once I get in the door with that, then I'm finding out there's the basic needs with um, food, with heat, you know, all these additional stressors, because I think that's the other piece. When we think of the youth and we think of the depression and the anxiety, it's not just the youth, it's a family issue, you know, and, and a lot of times that's what they're reacting to and responding to is, is everything going on. So I think it's very unique to be able to go into the homes and be able to work with them all together and then be able to take that information back to the school. And, and I think that kind of tweaks a little bit maybe how the school works on things where, you know, maybe we are gonna be a little bit more delicate with things. That students that's got, oh, 50 to 60 to 70% of their assignments that haven't been handed in, it's not gonna be like, you have to get all that in. Where can we start? What can we do? Um, so I think communication and collaboration is really the key and just the education to be able to just have people know what little things to look for, not necessarily the obvious signs. Um, and you had mentioned the QPR, which is interesting because I had just approached Mr. Primo about that um, for the summer. I'm not completely trained yet. I've got a little bit more to do to finish it, but I'm going to offer it out hopefully to the teachers, um, which they can do like a summer 
training with me to get them familiar with it. And really what another thing that we were doing before the pand pandemic hit was myself and um, our student assistance counselor who focuses on substance abuse, uh, we were doing educational nights to the community where we had a, a series of different topics that we wanted to focus on with um, drugs and alcohol was going to be one piece, parenting was going to be another, how to access resources within the community. But then we got shut, we, we got one of them done <laughs> and then the pandemic hit. So ultimately I would really like to be able to um, do that again. And then another amazing thing that I think we have coming up is uh, they're going to be doing a summer rec program at South Lewis. And in addition to the, the academic piece of it, there's going to be a lot of health and wellness. So I think that that's going to be a phenomenal opportunity to, you know, start to build some of those skills with the children and um, just get them thinking about them and just how important they are. And I talk too much, I'm sorry. <laughs> I get really passionate about it. So. What's QPR? Question, persuade, and refer. Question? Question, persuade, and refer. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to pick up the thread where kind of we left off with somebody gets a pickup notice, I forget what you call pickup it. Pickup order. Pickup order. Then what happens? So at that point, depending where they are, the law enforcement go there. We've done them right from our clinic, um, and they transport them to either Samaritan or to Utica, depending if Samaritan's on diversion. And then at that point, we they are there. If they're our client, we follow up, we track them. If they're not our client, um, at that point, the handoff is to the hospital and they'll do the evaluation and they'll determine if they're going to be admitted for further services, like an inpatient stay, or if they'll be released. And at that point, if they're released, if they are admitted and then released, we get paperwork follow-up for a five day. And at what point we step in and we begin with our safety planning and services. Or if they're a current patient, we continue at that point. We also have um, in clinic, it's in house, it's more for us, for our tracking and for our team. We have a high risk list. So if patients are higher acuity, um, more of a risk, they are placed on our high risk list. So all of our staff and reception staff are aware. So if a patient calls or a family member calls, we're aware that that patient's more high risk or they've had a recent hospitalization. So at that point, we know to, if they're flagged in a sense, to get them right back in or get their therapist interviewed immediately. How many people are on that list? Oh, I would have to pull it. There's um, I want to say roughly at this time, maybe 20 give or take. And now that's how many? Like what what are you saying? 897. So you have 897 clients for six staff members? This is, I'm, I'm, I apologize, it's for Jefferson and Lewis. I'm thinking of our whole, okay, yes. Um, for Lewis, huh? Yes, yes. Um, that's our total. And we and I put the total out there because we have some clients that live on the line or they might, um, like a clinician here that they started with, but they have a preference of a male or female provider, so we try and accommodate. And so if our male provider at that time, our psychiatric nurse practitioners in our Watertown clinic, some, they'll go to there. This way they have the preference um, so that they're comfortable. They can kind of select who they work with. So if the individual is 19 years old, do you still talk to the parents before they're released from Watertown? Or how would that work? Yeah. No. Samar if they're an adult, so we, when they're they discharged from Samaritan, say. if they're discharged from Samaritan, they're an adult, we get their information, we contact them. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You get so the information it, automatically, even if they aren't one of your clients? No. Um, all patients have a choice where they go. So if they are not our current client and they are admitted to Samaritan, whether because they call our crisis line um, and we had sent them for evaluation, they have a choice, um, so they can opt to say, no, I want to go to River Hospital, or I live closer here, I want to go to this clinic. And Samaritan, at that point, will send the discharge paperwork to whatever entity of the patient's choice. Yeah. So if you could wave a magic wand and get something tomorrow for this county for mental health, what would it be? Good 
top of our list bad. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell them a little bit about the planning that goes into? All right. So one of the biggest chores of our department is the annual local service plan. And that is something that we develop. I guess I'm going to get rid of that. Um, that we develop um, with the idea of what is the current needs of your county. We got we solicit that information from everyone um, so that we have you know a lot of voices contributing to that. Um, that is reviewed at least once a year um, and then submitted annually. Um, I can tell you for the past four years, the barriers to treatment, um, the things that complicate someone accessing treatment is transportation, um, and inconsistent or available transportation workforce um, in regards to retaining qualified professionals, substance use disorders, and how many cases. Those are the things that, they, that have, have made the cut every year. Um, the idea of that plan is to help guide the treatment community, the county, um, in meeting the needs that are kind of identified in your county. It also informs our regulatory agencies as to what our needs are in the event that there is some additional funding, which I've not seen yet, um, available to be able to meet the needs of your, of your community. Um, so that's kind of what guides us. Um, I think that in addition to that annual service plan that we you know, keep carrying forward, um, the other thing that we have some influence on is the other things that contribute to a person not being well. Or a family not being well. So you're talking about poverty, you're talking about access to food, you're talking about housing, um, you're talking about access to medical care. Um, any of those areas can predispose or exacerbate somebody with mental health or substance use disorders. Um, so, so that's kind of the big picture. Um, and Sometimes we, I think the other thing that doesn't make it is sometimes the regulatory requirements that are posed on agencies that sometimes are conflictual and sometimes aren't supporting common sense or getting the needs of the people met. And we have very little control over that. Was there anything, Ms. Boring? No, I just pick up on, uh, you know, Pat mentioned um, funding. So no matter what it is we want to deliver, uh, we sort of have to follow along with what the state makes available, which is really just an uh, opportunity for me to comment that this year, uh, what has come through the state, uh, particularly in the area of mental health, has been a very robust uh, budget. Uh, lots of, uh, you know, things that will help um, solve the problems that we have with wage compression when um, Walmart and Target are paying more for entry-level staff uh, than we're able to pay. Um, things having to do with housing uh, are coming through and, and to me housing is really one of the most important things. If I do not have a safe place to lay my head that night then I'm not going to be able to begin to address any of the other needs that I have. Lots of, you know, what we're seeing now, a lot of people talk about maybe kind of like an iceberg type thing. There's the people that we know and what is visible to us. And as we continue to emerge from the pandemic, we're worried about what's underneath the service or surface. Um, certainly with our kids, um, there will be, uh, we'll want to focus on resiliency, on trauma informed care. Um, and, uh, you know, with adults, if, if we can have them engage with work, if we can have them safely housed, uh, those are definitely uh, good things moving forward. The other thing that I didn't mention that I think is probably even at the base of all that is really the stigma. My God, there's a million reasons why people can not seek treatment. They're embarrassed. It isn't, it isn't accepted. They're judged. Um, you know, they're, they're held to the, to, you know, the, like the worst of the worst. Um, and that is probably one of the biggest barriers and challenges that, you know, we as a community really need to look at. You don't want to talk about it. You don't want to hear about it. Um, 
you are socially not going to see. I mean, I'm sorry, there's sometimes you see stuff and it's impolite to bring it up or you don't. It's not socially acceptable to talk about it. Um, you know, and unfortunately that can have dire consequences. Um, and people, and then people's attention to the clock. Um, I'm going to give you an example. I was at a, at a, this is, I still can't get over this. I'm at one of the farmer's markets. I have a table full of stuff. I got, I got pens, I got information. And as soon I had two people that felt comfortable coming and talking to me, they would get to where that table what I had or what I was doing. Oh, oh, I, no, I don't need that. And I mean, it was like I was shocked, like pariah. And I'm like, are you kidding me, people? Um, you know, everything, all the data that I keep track of and, and monitor shows that our county has a significant substance use problem. It's there, it's killing people. Um, we have a lot of poverty. We have a lot of debt, depression, anxiety. We got to be talking about it, and it's got to be okay. Um, and you know, I want to say, and these are old statistics in my head. Years ago, it used to be like, you know, one in four people have someone in their life that either themselves or they suffer, you know, someone from mental health. Two in four is a substance abuse problem. Okay, well, all right. Well, I'm thinking that in this room, how many of that is? All right. But yet, if you ask somebody, no, not me, nothing I need, it's hard out there. It's very hard. And, you know, I think that, that while, it, is our system perfect? Absolutely not. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely. But I got to tell you, we got to work together to make this, to make this. Yeah. And if you're not willing to trust your support or, or make somebody uncomfortable, we're not going to get anywhere. Sorry. Lisa, more directly to your point, universal access to high-speed internet and technology um, is definitely a plus. Mel can talk about what it has done to uh, participation, uh, engagement, and services for a lot of our adults. It may not always be so good for the kids because it's the paying attention sort of thing, but um, attendance for adults appointments actually increased during the pandemic when we went to the telephonic. Uh, that has uh, the potential to remove some of the stigma because I'm still in my house. I'm not going out and not seeing the people downtown or seeing somebody in a waiting room uh, that uh, works with me or, or lives down the street. Uh, I, it's not my favorite solution, but if it gets somebody in, engaged with service and starting to make some improvements in their life, then so Absolutely, I agree, and that's something that we were talking about over the weekend. Um, if anything, one thing that came from this is we learned that traditional mental health services don't have to be provided in your typical brick and mortar in the past. You know, you show up in, in person. We're able to reach out to people in many different ways now. We can do telephonic, we can do video, um, and, and I'm thankful there's been some great pandemic hit that I was able to take that, and I primarily work with younger children, you take these trainings and you learn how to start sessions and making sure the same, you know, the scene per se, or their home is safe, who is in the home with you. So if something happens, so it definitely brought like to much better access options for many people. And I think the schools, I mean, really went out of their way. Again, I know I'm speaking primarily of South Lewis, but to ensure that students had access to that technology, whether it be the hot spots, and then each student was issued a tablet or a Chromebook. Um, the unfortunate part for us is some areas are just so rural, but even the hot spots didn't work um, fantastically, but they were there and, and that was a huge help. And I know that we are presently seeking out other grants as well to keep those hot spots available in that technology. So in here we have uh some other health and human service folks, maybe that they'd like to jump in. Sure. Jerry, Crystal, Jenny, Ashley. Ladies, or Jerry. <laughs> so, from a public health standpoint, suicide prevention was 
one of our top priorities for community health improvement. Um, so obviously with all of the COVID work, um, you know, we haven't been working as diligently on the, the prevention efforts that we have had, um, but from a public health standpoint, that's obviously our our focus is prevention from even, you know, getting down the road to having thoughts of suicide. Um, hopefully things will uh, continue to slow down for us in the COVID response um, and those efforts will, will start back up again. Um, our suicide rate is definitely something that, that we monitor um, and I do believe strongly uh, as Marie said that we have not seen the effects of, of what COVID has done to especially our young um, so that's something that I feel we need to, as a community, um, have an eye on and, and monitor because living in Lewis County my entire life, we are a strong community, we are not one to ask for help, and I think there will be a lot of people out there that will not be asking for help, um, will think that it's not okay to ask for help, we need to let them know that it is okay and <laughs> and just keep an eye on one another. So that's the only thing I have. So from social services standpoint, we've seen an increase in child protection reports. So we're about a month ahead of normally where we would be by now. Um, and obviously at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a great slowdown of reports because as Mel said, there's not so many people having eyes on the children. Um, but my caseworker was a report, and they've been home visiting during the entire pandemic. One of the few agencies that did, okay? Um, increased anxiety and depression in adults. You can see it with the parents. You can see that concern. And the concern of their children. Um, obviously, access to food and shelter that they talked about. We go hand in glove with mental health and work back and forth um, to make sure those needs get met. But it's getting harder and harder. Um, with um, finding locations, um, we moved to telephonic interviews as well. Um, you know, our foster care has remained uh, pretty stable. We have staff trained in QPR uh, that they mentioned. We also have access to agency-wide training on some suicide prevention. Um, so our examiner level staff and, uh, can take a look at that when we get clients in um, that talk about self-harm and what to do that does happen with us and could be crisis calls in the clinic or pickup orders or in the home trying to convince someone that they need help and we need to get them to the hospital happens with the elderly happens with the teens happens with the very young um kind of all over the place so we rely so much on you know look at mel at the school what are the school saying melanie saber at the clinic what is what does the clinic mean how do we get into the clinic and crisis transport you know, um, with Pat Fralick, one of my adult protective people went over and talked with her the other day just to decompress from working with someone. It is so, I'm going to use the word clinically crazy, which is very difficult, but when you get swore at and spit at and thrown at constantly, it wears on your own psyche, and then they need help. So, you know, I, I thanked Pat this morning for being available to help one of my crew deal with that. So I guess one of the things that would be helpful is, and only my lack of poor communication, is understanding, you know, when I make my reports, like everybody does, um, how it ties back to us. So like, say for example, when you, think, when you think about the challenges of workforce, you know, again, we're, and I think the biggest hospital staff, there's, it's hard and it's hard to keep people here. So there's turnover. And when you have turnover, despite your best efforts, it impacts clients. You do the best you can, but it's a new face. I got to, you know, I hear this, it's a new face. I don't want to tell my story again. But that's the other side of, um, you know, workforce challenges. Right now, we talked about how a person got to the emergency room at Samaritan, which is our 
designated hospital. So right now, Office of Mental Health every year takes beds that we don't have enough of and they're off the block. So when we don't have enough beds and they're removing 200 more, you've got people sitting in the emergency room. And the acuity rate of what a year ago might have got you admitted, now it might not, it's got to be even higher. And then you've got people that are, are out on the street and doing that. Um, adolescents, there is no adolescent beds out there. We have children in the emergency room that are sitting there for days, four days, waiting five days for a bed. Now, I'm sorry. I think that's abusive. I'm, I'm sorry. I know they've got no choice. But can you imagine sitting in a room with nothing but glass, you're in pajamas, and you're there, and they bring you your tray? You're not getting treatment. You're just waiting. That's the way it is. So, so there's systematic issues that we're trying to fill the gaps here in a resource-poor county, and we're not alone. Um, so, so these big things, you know, last year, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, the sky is falling, lady. There, you know, money was not guaranteed in December. We don't have enough money, and they're talking about taking, and they took it away. You know, how does Maureen plan for that? How does she staff for that? Because it's not like you got a pot of gold out back. You know what I mean? But so so I guess it's not that I don't think you read my stuff, but I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, it's but but those are the things that are sometimes mostly out of our control. But we're trying to plan for the other side of that. We're trying to, to anticipate a crisis or anticipate a gap. And without a magic ball and, and being prepared, proactive, so that we don't have a tragedy. Because that's what we're talking about here, is tragic events. I'm glad that we're not doing being taped today. You are being taped. You are. That's why. So, financially, it just an interesting, an, an addition to what Pat and Maureen have been saying is, Yes, the state restored funding from last year, and they may have even bumped it up. They bumped it up for chips. They bumped it up for mental health. Well, that's nice. They had a fifteen billion dollar budget deficit. The state or the federal government gave them fifteen billion dollars. They spent it all to plug these holes. We're going to be exactly in the exact same boat in twenty twenty three. Yeah. So you know, it was nice that the state has you know taken this money and gave given a one year increase to get everybody back on their feet. But it does not solve the long-term problem. The other problem is there's been a movement in New York State for 15 years to close mental health beds, particularly for children. Um, that's you know that was a thought that institutionalization is not the answer, and so institutions have been closed, and now we don't have any beds. And I am not saying institutions were the answer, but there's a severe lack of mental health beds in the North Country now, and the only place for them is you know, our hospitals have a handful of beds each, and that's about it. So. One of the other things that the uh, state aggressively try, tries to do is to acquire as many federal Medicaid dollars as is possible. And as a result, uh, they come up with new programs that are designed to be paid for by Medicaid. But what that means at the provider level in the community is that program has to look like something that can legally be paid for by Medicaid. And that does not necessarily, those constraints do not always allow us to deliver the most uh, actually desirable program services to. It's been an ongoing struggle for a few years now as well. And that's, I think, what the counter is involved in is like. So we get funding, but the funding is very prescriptive. And it's, again, not meeting a true need. But I mean, so it's me approving that those money that we get to TLS are being spent appropriately um, and signing off on that on behalf of everybody sitting in this room. Um, and then Maureen doing the best she can in regards to the confinement of what is supposed to be happening. Um, versus what she's finding out from um, the population that she's serving.
Sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense. Any other questions or comments? You folks have been incredibly generous with your yes. time this afternoon. We really appreciate your having <laughs> invited us in. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll get that baseline information um, and set that back uh, out your way. Uh, Dick, thank you for sharing a concern with Pat. Um, Can we just give me oh. some thoughts? Yes, uh, absolutely. Oh, you got my email, yeah? Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll look into that. Yep. It just kind of substantiates what mm -hmm. we have heard today. So that was good. Thank you all for coming in and all the good information. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about the sad stuff. I know. I know. Sorry about Grant. That wasn't going to But this is a good time to do it. May Especially is mental health. May is mental health. Flashing light. Mm -hmm. Okay, shall we continue with um, resolutions? Oh, Jenny is Jenny. Says five minutes, Jenny. Eric, I'm just going to join you over there. Comfortable. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. oh, that's all right. Steve. Yes. We're going to start with something else first so we can keep it in the mind. Oh, sorry. All right. So I was asked to speak for five minutes on some employment programs that we have at Social Services for Youth. So it's interesting that I'm the back end of the conversation we had about mental health and what's happening with our youth. So we know it's important to keep our youth engaged in the community. So maybe have not seen by school, but if they're employed, maybe they're being seen. So I'm going to start with a couple of programs that we do. One is uh, the Summer Youth Employment Program. Been around forever. I've been there 31 years. It's always been there. We get in the neighborhood of $57,000 to $67,000 a year directly from the state, zero local share to pay salary for kids to go to work, okay? And that is really things like mowing lawns, washing dishes, those kind of things. But it's to teach um, activities around employment, paying up on time, cashing a paycheck, having a bank account. And our employment counselors actually help children do that. They'll go help them set up a bank account so they could um, learn to practice banking. We do have some kids that choose to hand it over to their parents. Um, this is an income qualified program, 200% of the poverty level. You can be a little bit about that if um, the youth has um, a recorded disability, okay? So um, we go between ages of 14 and 20. We kind of work our way backwards in the age because 14 year olds really can't do a lot of stuff safely to help an employer. Um, that program is ramping up. Um, we are still accepting applications. Uh, the state has not given me the allocation yet this year. They've told us to be ready and get started while they figure it out. Um, we are doing orientation Saturday with the first group of kids. Um, and we have employers all over the place, um, public, private, and for-profit locations take summer youth employees. Um, then we have two WIOA, Force Innovation and Opportunity Act programs for youth. So one is in-school youth, and that means kids that are still in high school, um, and they're looking for a job. Unfortunately, that funding has been cut way back um, to help in-school youth. Um, so we probably can fund one, maybe two kids per year in the in-school youth category. Now, this is Department of Labor money, and if you think about it, it's those resolutions that you approve to accept the NOAA, the Notice of um, Allocation of Funding. This is a combined effort with Jefferson County 
um, and the Workforce Development Board. And the other pot of money that we get is for out of school youth. So go 18 to 24 years old, and you're eligible if you have a barrier to employment. You're pregnant, you're parenting, you didn't complete high school, um, you have criminal justice involvement. So finding these kids is sometimes hard that want to participate and move into it move into employment. Um, that money is much higher, and the federal government keeps directing Department of Labor to shift more from in-school youth funding to more and more out-of-school youth funding. Um, so we can do um, work experience programs, on-the-job training, uh, community work, um, all those kinds of things. We do classroom training with these kids. Um, they are harder and harder to find, probably because we have a very high graduation rate in Lewis County. So I know Lewis and Jefferson both struggle with that because we have a very high graduation rate. The urban centers that are only graduating in the 50s and 60 percentiles of youth um, are much more flush with those kids. The last one I want to talk about, if you want to pull that up, is the Careers Here uh, Pratt Northam program. So this, um, we have, this is only the second year DSS has administered this program for Pratt Northam. This was shut down last year because of the pandemic. So I think if you roll down, Connor, for me um, and keep going. So Pratt Northam funds this right there on the youth programs. Um, you'll see that Pratt actually runs two programs. They run the workership programs, which a lot of people are very familiar with. So that's youth. They uh, Business locations apply through Pratt Northam to be an accepted site location. And you'll see that around the county, a lot of county departments um, apply to become a site location. And then students apply to those site locations. Pratt Northam directly pays the salary of those people. So I think like here, they probably send an allocation to cover some of that. Pratt covers the, the uh, hourly rate plus the FICA and everything. All right, the other program that they run is Careers Here. And Careers Here is really a student-driven program that students are entering college for both undergrad and graduate level work. Um, so this is the program designed to try to take our youth and have them stay here and not leave the area for higher paying jobs. Um, There's a go back a little bit. I'm sorry. Down, That's down a little bit. Go down now. Workership at careers here. There we go. Thank you. So you'll see on their website, um, they have uh, Lisa Hexner at DSS and her email address to contact. They always also put information out on the Facebook page and on Instagram for youth. I do know it's advertised in the high schools. Um, guidance counselors uh, know about this. And then um, we have a lot college kids that apply for this program. Um, right now we have 24 college and high school seniors that are entering college expressed an interest in careers here as well as five BOCES students. Um, out of that we had 10 contracts get signed. A lot of youth uh, of this level actually found higher paying jobs out on the economy because this is a minimum wage payment job and um, you know they find found higher paying elsewhere. I think we have one in here right now. She's one of our careers here students in the back, and she's assigned to the law department. So those are the kind of students that we're talking about: no income qualification in school, looking to stay in their career path and look for that. So um, we've had um, so far eleven female and three male placements. We've had majors that include occupational therapy, nursing, uh, physician assistants, biomedical science, chemical engineering, poli sci, veterinary medicine, um, history, math, business and marketing, communications, and uh, electrical gas and diesel programs through BOCES. So we have certain slots for BOCES kids and then other slots for college kids. Um, all the way from colleges from CUCA, Nazareth, Roberts Wesleyan, Stevens, U of R, U of B, BU, Cornell, St. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. For the first time, a community college, Herkimer Community College, has a student, um, and Fairfield University. So they're at places they can be 
for-profit, not-for-profit, or government. The location doesn't matter. It's to match with what that degree pathway is. Okay. Um, so we have some in double play that are doing some like exercise science work, uh, Countryside Vet, Aries Chemical for the chemical engineer, Level Medical Associates finally took one this year. <laughs> um, it's hard if you're in healthcare. Like I'm going to look at Lisa. You have to get so far in your education before you can touch a patient. So in order to you know find a placement for a youth that really wants healthcare, a lot of those slots are used up for you. Chill college students, they're already in their clinical rotations. And they have to wait for the clinical rotation. Jerry left, but I'm sure he agree with me. Um, Black Order Naturals, the health system, um, in the communications department, we've got a few marketing majors this year. Um, and I know a couple years ago, Jerry had a careers here student, and it did exactly what it was supposed to do. She uh, was assigned to the CEO of the hospital for the summer. She did some very specific work for him. Jerry, I'm talking about you. About your careers here, student, you had a few years. How successful that was because after that, um, he had had conversations with her. She continued to agree at Upstate and now is coming back to us as a, 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 a laboratory science person here at our own hospital. That's what Careers Here is, tries to do. Get our kids, get them in the pathway, get them assigned to a local business, and keep them back here. So that's what Careers Here is for. Uh, Pratt designs the program, and they tell us what we can do and what we can't do. Um, this is only the second year we had to shut down due to the pandemic last year. Um, and uh, FYI, we do this free of charge for Pratt Northam. So that's the right thing to do. Any questions? Okay. Five minutes? <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Why is it happening? <laughs> Okay. okay. Um, the first docket is a resolution amending compensation plan of the County of Lewis with reference to Lewis County General Hospital to create one full-time purchasing agent position and one part-time stores clerk position. Any questions? Even if there are no questions, but I offer a point of view here. So we built those positions into the budget so that the budget uh, that was sent to you uh, for FY21 uh, was approved by the Board of Managers and then was approved by this body. Um, we held off posting the positions um, so that one, we could make sure we had cards, and two, we had two casuals working in the department for the um, the store's clerk position. That's the person who gathers supplies and gets it to where it has to go. Um, essentially, we have a casual who's retiring out, and then another casual who's not dependent. Um, with all of the PPE requirements that, that we now face, we just need coverage in the store. So that's, that drives that position. And for a period of time, the other position, a purchasing agent, was not filled, and basically we delegated those duties to others, and the person it was delegated to was our controller. And you reach a point where that is not the efficient way to drive the purchasing requirement. There's a lot of research, work with the GPO to maximize pricing. So we're now at that place. And anticipating that, that's why we put it through the budget process. So I just wanted to give you the information behind the scenes. Thank you. Once again, any questions? All in favor? Aye. And may I also say one more thing? <laughs> Not related to this topic, so I'll be out of order. Okay, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, the program that Jenny was just speaking to, um, this is an exciting thing. Uh, she graduated just this month, and uh, she is starting her new career in the lab. What's most uh, important to me is we identified her in the fall of 2019 and actually worked with the bargaining unit so we could offer her a position upon graduating. 
because there are certain specialties that people are hired before they graduate, and that's the market we compete with. So local person, outstanding academically, um, and wants to live and raise her family in Lewis County. So when you can put and bring all those pieces together, if it wasn't for the program, um, we would never have met her. And uh, so it really is a terrific program. Thank you. Sounds good, Jerry. Yep, thank you. <laughs> Were there any nays to that resolution? <coughs> um, resolution authorizing agreements between public health and various agency contractors and independent contractor who provide services to the preschool special education program at rates set and approved by the New York State Education Department for the period beginning July 1st, 2021 and will renew annually. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Resolution authorizing acceptance of temporary assistance for needy families, allocation of $25,000 for non-residential domestic violence services, an agreement between Lewis County <laughs> Department of Social Services and Lewis County Opportunities as service provider under the plan. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Any nays? Resolution to appropriate funds for career tier program for BOCI students or in college students during the summer of 2021 at an hourly rate of $12.50 with funds provided by the Pratt Northam Foundation. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Any nays? <laughs> Any motions? Um, nope, I did not have any motions. Okay. So now we can adjourn. Um, or was there something else? You need an executive session, right? Don't you want to close your meeting? Yeah, okay. okay, I'll make that motion. Well, I just need to close my meeting. Yeah, so I'm just going to request after the three committee meetings have now concluded that we hold an executive session to discuss liability issues and an update on rate negotiations. Second. Okay, so, so the motion to adjourn. Yeah. Lisa. And then uh, we need a motion for executive session. Did we, do we need a second on that? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I'll make the motion for executive session. Okay. And he's going to there. Okay, take a deep breath. Almost done. <laughs> Joe, Joe, who do you? The legislators for this executive session. What's that? The legislators only. Yes. Uh, and of course, HR and. Oh, oh okay. actually, hurry back. Can I talk to you? Brian, right. you got out. Oh, it's called me. Six days. It was hot as heck.